welcome, welcome. My name's Amanda. I'm one of the directors here at Brain Balance. And as people are jumping on, we are going to just ask some polls throughout the evening. And this is our first question of the evening. If this is your first time joining us. So as those answers come in, wow, guys, it's the end of September. I can't even believe it. It felt like summer just started last month or a few months ago, right? And here we are. We've got the holidays knocking at the door and most of our children, if not all of our children are back in school, right? Either your child has been in school for several weeks now, or if you're in the North, we know that you guys get to start right after Labor Day. And so you guys are in school for what? About two or three weeks now. Um, but usually at this time, right? Homework starts coming home. Homework time is a challenge. You might start be getting some notes from school. And so tonight we're gonna talk about the impact of brain function and how that can impact a child's learning. So sure enough, 84% of you guys are new. So welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. So here we go. Um, so yeah, so we have homework time is a challenge, right? And so we're gonna be talking about that tonight. But the other thing I wanna share with you guys first is that we have many directors on from our Brain Balance locations. We have three centers in California, Redland, San Diego, and Chula Vista. We have the Brain Balance of Wilmington, Delaware. We've got several centers in Florida participating tonight, Lake Mary, Winter Garden, Coral Springs, Jacksonville, Naples, Palm Beach, and West Chase. We have three centers in Georgia, Peachtree City, Roswell, and Swanee. We have the Blainfield, Indiana Center. We have Edwardsville, Illinois, Overland Park, Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, Louisville, Kentucky, Oakland County, Michigan, Woodbury, Minnesota, Chesterfield, Missouri, St. Charles, Missouri, Omaha, Nebraska, Summit and Bergen County in New Jersey. We have Plainview in New York. We have Charlotte and Cornelius in North Carolina, Columbus and Cincinnati in Ohio, Wexford, Pennsylvania, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, Farragut, Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee. We have Allen, Lubbock, Fort Worth, Austin, and Cedar Park, Texas. We have Midlothian, Virginia, Mequon, Wisconsin, and Fox Valley, Wisconsin, Wisconsin um, on tonight. And here's the thing. We have texting capabilities. So there are phone numbers that are in the chat. If you find your center that's nearest you and you wanna ask specific questions about your child, feel free to send a text. There are people there that are gonna be answering um, questions through text. You can also type a question in the chat and we have moderators on that are answering questions as you text in the chat box. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm going to answer live questions. I love at, um, answering live questions. It's a lot of fun. So if you have a question that you feel like would be helpful that more people hear, then save your question and, um, and I will be happy to be able to answer some of those questions at the end. But again, we have directors on, so there's multiple ways you can be communicating with us during this presentation. All right, so as I was sharing, we're in school, we've got challenges with homework maybe, challenges at school, and I often like to start with just looking at what is the definition and the criteria for diagnosing a specific learning disability. Because many times parents are asking like, does my child have a really specific learning disability or does my child just struggle with learning or what is the criteria? So we always like to start off the presentation talking about what is the criteria specifically for a DSM diagnosis of a specific learning disability? And here's what it says. It says that a specific learning disability can be a type of a neurodevelopmental disorder that impedes the ability to learn or use specific academic skills. So example, if your child has struggled with learning how to read, struggle with learning how to write, or even in arithmetic or mathematics, 
So that numeration element of understanding number numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, which really these elements of learning how to read, how to write, how to do basic math is really the foundation for academic learning. So that's really what the DSM criteria is for a child to be diagnosed with a learning disability. Now let's think about that for a second. It says basically having a neurodevelopmental disorder that impedes the ability to learn. So that's really just in essence, a symptom, right? Then you have specific diagnoses such as dyslexia, which is a reading disorder, disorder that's characterized by difficulty with recognizing letters, difficulty learning letter sounds, identifying rhyming words, delayed language development, or trouble learning to spell and write. It also can be a processing disorder as well, but as you can see, these are symptoms. Same thing with the diagnosis of dyscalculia. This is difficulty processing basic addition and subtraction, may struggle with visual spatial relationships, difficulty processing what he or she hears, almost always counts on their fingers, even after third grade especially. So with dyslexia, dyscalculia, and now we have dysgraphia. Right, And this is a disorder that's characterized with difficulties with fine motor skills. Um, for example, tying their shoes, zipping a jacket, writing legibly, unfinished words or missing words or letters when writing, tendency to write or copy things very slowly, difficulty writing and thinking at the same time. So here we've had all these specific DSM diagnoses. And as you can see, it's really just a list of symptoms. Now, here's a poll question for you guys. All right, do you have a child, a teen or a young adult that struggles um, and that is formally diagnosed with either dyslexia, dysgraphia or dyscalculia? Maybe they're formally diagnosed with an auditory or visual processing disorder, or do they struggle with reading comprehension and math problem solving, or are you seeing symptoms where your child is taking long hours to complete homework or may not even turn their homework in? And then the final option is you're struggling in the essence of all of the above, um, when it comes to your child and learning. So this is something that we often hear in our centers. We serve children that have formal diagnoses, and then we serve children that are not formally diagnosed, but yet they are having symptoms and they're really struggling with learning. They can be struggling with focus and attention. They can be struggling with homework meltdowns around homework, meltdowns around going to school. So a lot of times families that come to brain balance, they have a lot of these symptoms. So here we go. Okay, so basically what we're seeing is, is that many are seeing symptoms of struggling with reading comprehension or math problem solving. They're taking long hours to complete homework or they may not turn it in at all. So that's 59% for reading comprehension and math problem solving and 58% with difficulty with homework. And that's the thing, that's what we hear in our centers often. So here's what some of the research says. Did you know that one in five children in the US have learning challenges? It's actually more prevalent than discussed really. And there are many challenges that children that struggle with learning can face. A third of students with learning challenges often are held back a grade level um, and they're required to have to repeat certain grades. Um, we also so, see that in children that struggle with learning, they are at high risk for depression. 
So 14 and 40% of the children with learning challenges suffer from depression because oftentimes school is such a struggle that it really requires them to not want to do much when it comes to school. And that's when you can see low self-esteem and that's when you can see depression. So here's another question. I always love to hear from parents, what are your main concerns? Is it the fact of that your child's struggling with learning and how it's impacting their self-esteem? Is their behavior escalating perhaps specifically at school or even around homework time where it's impacting your relationship with your child? Are you concerned about your child's future when it comes to academic success? Are you thinking to yourself, gosh, if my child is already struggling now in school, what does adulthood look like? Or it could be all of the above, that you're having all of the above of these thoughts of what really is concerning to you. So I'd love to hear from you guys as far as what do you feel like is most concerning um, when you're really thinking about your child and it relates to learning. So let's see what you guys have to say. All right, so we have 55% saying that it's really impacting your child's self-esteem. 54% are concerned about the future of academic success. And 44% are really thinking about if they're already struggling now, what does adulthood look like? And those are all very valid concerns because what the research really does show is that children that struggle with learning they are twice as likely to be suspended because oftentimes you can see their behavior um, increase at school when a child is struggling. It's almost like a coping skill where they just want to get out, right? We also see that the research shows that dropping out is more of a risk, that they're three times more likely to drop out. And then for those that are concerned about adulthood and what this looks like um, for them as adults, that's a very valid concern because 46% of adults really struggle with maintaining employment if they have a history of learning struggles and learning challenges. But here's the good news is that these challenges have nothing to do with intelligence that they're actually caused by how the brain processes information. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight because the good news is, is that through the study of neuroplasticity, we can continue to build connections in the brain. Not only in children, where we once thought that once your child hit a certain age, that was it, the brain was developed and there was no hope. That's actually false. What the latest research says through the study of neuroplasticity is that we can continue to improve and develop neuropathways in the brain, that we can build new connections in the brain, and that the stronger brain connections equal stronger processing skills. So let's dive a little bit deeper because my goal for you tonight is for you to have a better understanding of not just what is going on. Because oftentimes when you go for a diagnosis, just as I shared with you, with this, talking about specific learning disabilities, talking about dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, dysgraphia, if you really look at those definitions, that really gives you the what, okay? The symptoms that a child um, is displaying that equals a specific diagnosis. But my goal for you tonight is understand more about the why. Why is your child having these symptoms? Why is your child struggling? And if you can walk away with a better understanding of why, that's going to be super helpful for anyone. Um, and hopefully you will feel like this webinar was worth listening to. So let's dive deeper. So just as we talked about all the symptoms that we just talked about, poor grades, bad behavior at school, poor reading comprehension, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. Um, many times we hear parents say that the teachers are saying, well, your child's just lazy and if they would just try harder, um, which really saddens me because I'm going to be honest, I'm a former educator myself and you know, I share with parents often that children really desire to please. 
And if they are showing symptoms of quote unquote being lazy, there's usually more going on underneath because kids don't want to disappoint. You know, they don't want to disappoint their parents. They don't want to disappoint adults. And so typically children are not lazy. There's things going on underneath that's causing them to avoid schoolwork or avoid trying. Um, because when a child fails over and over again, I mean, think about all of us. When we fail over and over again, it's you get to a point where you're like, what's the point in trying? Because I'm just going to fail, right? And so that's oftentimes the situation. Maybe you're seeing meltdowns during homework time or kids are, your child's just giving up, you know, and they hate school. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, we're only in second and third grade and we have a long school career ahead of us, right? But all of these things, and the reason why I like to use a picture of the iceberg or an iceberg is because oftentimes what you're seeing and what you're experiencing at home are just symptoms. They're the visible symptoms that you are experiencing and seeing every day. But there's a whole lot more going on underneath that you may not visibly be seeing because you can't, because it's related to processing in the brain. So our goal at Brain Balance is really to create a brain that has optimal processing because optimal processing allows for your child to have optimal learning. So I often say a connected brain is a teachable brain. And to have a teachable brain, you have to have optimal processing in that brain. And so that's what we really focus on at Brain Balance is we're really looking at how is your child's brain processing information? Because that's the key to learning. So how do we look at processing? Well, first we look at things from what I call a developmental perspective. And it goes all the way back to when your child was born and they were a baby, they were born with what we call primitive reflexes. And primitive reflexes are survival reflexes that every baby's born with. They actually facilitate in the birthing process and they're present because your child's brain isn't fully developed. So for example, your baby will have what they call a palmar reflex, which is in the hand. And if you remember, if you put your finger in a baby's hand, they automatically clench to your finger because it's a survival reflex. It's a survival response. Um, however, that is appropriate in babies, a palmar reflex, but in a child after the age of 12 months to 18 months, they should not have those survival or primitive reflexes anymore, because if the brain is growing and developing appropriately, your baby doesn't need those reflexes anymore. Right. And so the palmar reflex in the hand is really critical in babies, but it's also really critical in the development of fine motor skills. And so if fine motor is developing appropriately, then your child doesn't need that palmar reflex any longer. But oftentimes children that struggle with learning can still have primitive reflexes that are present after they should be integrated and after they should be after that brain should be mature and they no longer need them. So primitive reflexes, again, when your baby's born, their brain is almost like in survival mode, right? Because it's only the brain stem and it's the emotional area of the brain that's developed. That's why when a baby is hungry, they cry. When they need to be changed, they cry because the only area of the brain that's developed at that point is the emotional area of the brain. However, it's through senses. So what your child sees, hears, smells, and feels, senses develop the brain and also motor develops the brain. Now, primitive reflexes are actually really critical to help with motor development. Um, if you actually watch a baby, they're constantly moving, right? Um, because motor is developing the brain. 
Um, and we think about in a baby, they lift their head, they roll over, they sit up, they crawl for four months, they stand up, they walk, then they start running. And then from gross motor, then fine motor starts developing in their hands, fine motor starts developing. You also have fine motor in their mouth, which is, you know, really key and critical all the way from birth, then moving up. And then there's also fine motor movements of the eyes, which are really critical for reading. So all to say that senses develop the brain and motor develops the brain. And so when we're looking at how that brain grows and develops, we need to look at the key foundations uh, that actually help with processing in the brain. So let me give you an example. All right. There's a primitive reflex called the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, which is actually really important for the development of the visual system. All right. Um, crawling, for example, is really critical for the development of the visual system. And so many times we can see where maybe your child didn't crawl appropriately, or maybe they were delayed in crawling, or maybe they just crawled for a few days or a few weeks. But crawling actually is really critical for the development of the visual system. And the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex actually helps get that baby crawling. Um, so, however, once that baby's crawling and walking and running, that asymmetrical tonic neck reflex should be integrated and should not be present any longer. Oftentimes, children that struggle with learning can have primitive reflexes that are still active and still present. So this is something that we look at at brain balance, because if a child, let's say three years old, four years old, five years old, has still has the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, that is a barrier for brain development. It's a barrier telling us that that is going to cause an impact in their development of their visual system. And so that is something that we have to look at as we're wanting to look at where's your child's strength in brain function and development? And are there any things that's, anything that's impacting development as well? Also too, senses are really critical, not only for brain development, but senses also impact learning. So when there are underdevelopments in the visual system, or there's underdevelopments in the auditory system, or there are underdevelopments in their fine motor systems, that's going to impact their ability to auditorily process, visually process. That's going to cause them to struggle with being able to write. So all of these things can really impact your child's ability to learn. And it can also impact the way the brain is developing, where then you can have under connections in the brain taking place, and therefore you don't have optimal processing. So the bottom line is, is again, primitive reflexes are involuntary motor responses that originate in the brainstem. They're present after birth in early child development that facilitates in survival. They're in the central nervous system for motor responses, and then they're eventually are integrated by age one to even 18 months. So there's a series of primitive reflexes that over time become integrated as the brain matures. However, if there are still active primitive reflexes now, you know, age two, age three and above, that is a sign of underdevelopments in the brain and it's a barrier to development. And it can be causing a barrier to develop their visual system, their auditory systems, their motor systems, and also the ability to multi-sensory process, um, which if you think about learning, it's all about multi-sensory processing. You know, when your child has to listen, watch, and do motor movements simultaneously, that is actually part of learning. So if we think about Again, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex can impact the development of the visual system. Then if your child has a weak visual system that can impact eye fixation, eye tracking, it can impact weak convergence and divergence of the eyes, which is actually really critical for looking at the board at school and looking at their paper at their desk. So when you have a weak visual system, that's when you're going to see the symptoms of saying where you hear teachers say, well, they're not focusing, their eyes are all over the place, they're not able to focus on one thing. 
It can also impact their ability to take notes from the board, and it can also impact reading fluency. So as you can see, the way the brain develops, it can impact academic performance. And so we really want to know why. And again, why are you seeing the symptoms that you're seeing? And we really want to be able to explain that to you and then basically develop a plan of action if we find any of these things taking place. Retained primitive reflexes are definitely a barrier to development of all sensory systems. And the essence of that, when you have weakness in their visual system and their auditory system and weakness in fine motor function and even body awareness, it can impact their ability to multitask. Uh, it can impact their ability to be able to process all of the information. So this is where many times parents will say, gosh, you know, he brings his agenda home and He's written down his homework assignment, but there's missing information. And so I don't even understand what we're supposed to do because he didn't get all the information down in his agenda, right? How many times has that happened, right? Um, or, you know, when you study for a test with your child and she goes into school and it's like, you know, she knows the information. She did awesome with the studying. And then she goes into school and then she bombs the test, right? And then all of a sudden she makes a 20 when you know that she knows that information. Well, oftentimes kids that struggle with anxiety, they struggle with um, test anxiety. There can be a primitive reflex called the Moreau reflex that really can cause them to go into fight, flight, or freeze. And they just go into that test and they're so anxious that their little brain goes into freeze mode. And then they're not even accessing the information that's actually in there that they actually know they're not even able to access it. So these are the things that we really wanna look at to have a better understanding, not just knowing what the problem is, but understanding why they're struggling. So here's a poll question for you. Has anyone ever connected the role of primitive reflexes and the development of your child's sensory systems or even having an understanding that it can impact the development of the brain and really impact their ability to learn? Um, because this is something that is often overlooked at understanding why they're struggling with learning. Um, and again, they can share well, we have difficulty with visual processing. We have difficulty with auditory processing, but we have to dig deeper. We have to understand why are they struggling with visual processing? Why are they struggling with auditory processing? And that's when we have to look at things from a developmental perspective because there could be primitive reflexes that's impacting development of their sensory systems. So, wow, it looks like. 73% of you guys are saying no, that you've never heard of this. And hopefully this is helpful information because it's absolutely something to consider when you're really trying to have a better understanding of why your child is struggling with learning. So we have to look at things from what I call a developmental perspective, but then we also have to look at things from a hemispheric perspective because we have two hemispheres of the brain. We have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. And here's the thing. I often say a balanced brain is a teachable brain. A connected brain is a teachable brain. And that's the goal of brain balance is we want to develop a brain that's teachable because that's what's critical. So when we're looking at understanding why your child is struggling, we also have to look at things from a hemispheric perspective. The left hemisphere of the brain, I often say, it's like the gas pedal of the brain. It's your processing hemisphere. It's your go, go, go brain. So the ability to remember facts and details, the ability to have strong verbal communication, fine motor is housed more in the left hemisphere of the brain. IQ, intellect, is more of a left hemispheric function. Logical and linear thinking is really more of a left brain function. Pattern recognition. If you think about early learning, 
Learning how to read is really about patterns. Understanding numeration, it's really about patterns. Spelling, phonics, all of those foundational elements to learning the basics of reading, writing, and math are really just a bunch of patterns. So the left hemisphere of the brain is about pattern recognition. Left hemisphere is also about motivation. It's also your processing hemisphere. So auditory processing, visual processing. And then academically, when we think about academics, between pre-K and second grade is more of a left hemispheric curriculum. Because if you think about it, pre-K is all about shapes, colors, numbers, letters. The left hemisphere of the brain is about letter recognition, numerical operations, word reading, spelling, and grammar. Then you have the right hemisphere of the brain which is the brake pedal of the brain. It's that ability to stop and think before acting. We call it that controlling impulsivity. Your right hemisphere of the brain is about nonverbal communication. So reading facial expressions. You know, how many times, right? When we were growing up, your mom gave you the look and you knew you had to straighten up fast, right? Well, if a child, if you give your child the look, and they just keep on doing what they're doing, um, they may not be reading facial expressions correctly. The right hemisphere of the brain is what I call your social skills brain. It's your emotional uh, area of the brain and social, uh, what we call emotional quotient. Um, it's your EQ, whereas your left brain is your IQ, your right brain is your EQ. So that ability to be able to handle social situations, having friends, being able to uh, be flexible is really key for the right hemisphere of the brain. Um, also, the ability to physically feel your body is housed in the right hemisphere of the brain. And academically, it's all about comprehension. So reading comprehension, math problem solving, word problems, the content of writing is more of a right hemispheric function. Gross motor skills are housed in the right hemisphere of the brain, whereas fine motor skills are housed in the left hemisphere of the brain. So when we're looking at both hemispheres, they really are different sides, but they complement each other. They need to be equally developing. They need to be constantly communicating. And we have to build connections between the two hemispheres. That's what optimal processing is. It's all about the cross communication of the brain, that the timing and the rhythm of the brain is in sync with each other. But how does the brain become in sync? Well, just like I said, they have to be equally developing and they need to be constantly communicating. However, oftentimes children that struggle with learning, there are areas of the brain that could be developing neurotypically, they could be strong. There could be areas of the brain where they're functioning above their chronological age or they're gifted in certain areas. But then there can be other areas of the brain that are underdeveloped and that are lagging. And so when you think about the research that talks about how both hemispheres of the brain have to be equally developing and cross communicating, if you have one hemisphere of the brain, and I often like to use the analogy of the internet, right? Because as parents, we've all grown up with the development of the internet. So imagine if you have one hemisphere of the brain functioning on Wi-Fi and it's really strong, and yet you have another hemisphere of the brain that there are some underdevelopments taking place. And so it's functioning more on dial-up. Can Wi-Fi and dial-up cross-communicate? No, they can't. And so that's where a functional disconnection can take place, where you have an imbalance in skill sets and one side of the brain can mature faster than the other. The strong side can even become overworked, or you can also see gifted skills. And then the weak side is becoming more weak and you have more symptoms as the child becomes older. 
And bottom line is that when you have underdevelopments in the brain, you're going to have asymmetry in the essence of that both hemispheres are not going to be able to cross communicate effectively and efficiently. And that's what's needed for optimal learning and development. You have to have a connected brain to be a teachable brain. You need to be have optimal processing in the brain to be able to learn easier. So here are some symptoms of a right brain weakness. Perhaps your child struggles with gross motor skills. Maybe they don't have as much interest in sports or they can be awkward and clumsy. They could be hyperactive. They could have difficulties with making friends and keeping friends. You can often see symptoms where they started off academically fairly strong or they were pretty typical, but as they hit third grade, they started struggling academically. That's where you see where they struggle with reading comprehension, math problem solving, because again, the academics of kindergarten through second grade and pre-kindergarten even through second grade are more of a left brain curriculum. And then as that academic shifts in third grade, then they have to read to learn. They have to do math problem solving to learn, to find answers. Versus in the beginning, they're just learning how to read, learning how to do math, which is more of a left brain function. So you can see where oftentimes children with a right brain weakness or underdevelopments in the right hemisphere, they could start off academically fairly okay. And then yet as they get older, they're struggling more and more academically. They can be impulsive, lack focus. They can even have difficulties with eye contact and being a space invader. So those are just some of the symptoms. Does your child have to have all the symptoms? No, definitely not. Um, but this is just giving you an idea of some symptoms of a right brain weakness. And then we have symptoms of a left brain weakness. And this is where you can see difficulties with learning math skills or difficulties with verbal communication, poor spelling, um, poor reading skills where they're struggling to learn how to read, poor letter recognition where they just guess, right? Um, they can have difficulties with auditory processing, difficulties with memory and remembering facts and details. Um, they can have low motivation. They oftentimes you will see task avoidance because they are more aware that they're struggling. Oftentimes children that have a left brain weakness, they socially can be really strong. They can even be strong in sports, um, but yet they struggle with learning and they're aware that they're struggling with learning. And so that's where you can see where they don't wanna answer any questions at school. They can appear to be very shy. And yet oftentimes the teachers love them because behavior wise, they actually can be fairly good kids. Um, and the teachers can love that, but yet they really struggle with learning. But here's the bottom line. What's really going on what the research is saying is that difficulty with behavior, focus, memory retention, academics, life skills, social skills, that it comes down to a lack of brain connectivity. So just like I was talking about earlier, where you have both hemispheres of the brain need to be connected. They need to be cross communicating effectively and efficiently. If there are under developments in the brain taking place, you're going to see a lack of brain connectivity. And when you see a lack of brain connectivity, that's when you see the symptoms of poor behavior, lack of focus and difficulties with learning. So here's a poll question for you. After reviewing the right and left hemisphere of the brain, where do you feel like the bulk of your child's struggles are stemming from? And here's the thing, you can see symptoms in the right hemisphere, you could see symptoms in the left hemisphere, you could see symptoms on both sides. And that is very common because if you think about it, if there are under connections in a hemisphere of the brain and there's a disconnect taking place, you're not seeing your child's full potential in their left hemisphere or their right hemisphere because there's under connections in the brain. Therefore, we're not even seeing their full potential in either hemisphere. 
So just as you're thinking about where do you see the most symptoms, you can absolutely see symptoms on both sides. So let's see what you guys say. Symptoms on both sides, 60%. And that is very common because when you have under connections in the brain taking place, that is definitely going to be where you're going to see symptoms on both sides. So how do we strengthen brain connectivity? That's always the big question. It's like, okay, Amanda, if we really understand that there are underdevelopments taking place in the brain, then how do we strengthen brain connectivity? Well, at Brain Balance, we strengthen brain connectivity by using a unique combination of exercises that impact both sensory and motor sim systems at the same time. The research says that for optimal development, you actually have to utilize multiple sensory inputs simultaneously with increased intensity over a period of time. What does that mean? Well, it means that the most powerful way to activate and strengthen brain connectivity is to activate the brain through your child's visual system while we're activating it through their auditory system even through olfactory, which is smell, even activating their brain through tactile stimulation, and also utilizing their motor systems, gross motor, fine motor. I often say to my parents, a coordinated body is a coordinated brain. Motor develops the brain. Gross motor develops the brain fine motor develops the brain. So we have to utilize your child's motor systems to actually develop the brain. But we can do that by also stimulating their brain through their visual system, through their auditory system, through their tactile system, and even through smell. It's really powerful. So it's all about activating the brain through multiple sensory stimulation simultaneously as well as utilizing their motor systems to activate their brain. So how do we strengthen brain connectivity? Well, we don't wanna focus on the dominant side. We really wanna focus on the areas of weakness because focusing on the areas of weakness will actually strengthen that specific hemisphere. But then we also wanna work on cross communication of the brain where both the right and hem left hemisphere are connected and working together because that's what we optimally need is we need both hemispheres cross communicating effectively and efficiently because that's what optimal brain connectivity is. And then if we have optimal processing taking place, then that means that your child's going to be able to learn and grow, not only academically, but socially and emotionally as well. So it's really all about strengthening the weak hemisphere and building on being able to see better cross communication in the brain, which is all about multisensory processing as well. And here's the thing. Environment also fosters optimal brain development. And so there are things that you can be doing at home to strengthen brain connectivity. I often encourage parents, and as the holidays are coming up, be strategic in what you purchase for your child. There are so many games out there that can work fine motor skills. There are so many games out there that can work eye tracking. And when you can make it fun for your child, they don't even realize that you're actually strengthening brain connections. So there's some great games out there. One of the ones we love to use um, at Brain Balance is Perfection um, because that is something that it's a timed game. So it's working on processing in the brain, but then also it's working on fine motor skills at the same time. Operation is another great game that works fine motor skills. So if you see a weakness in fine motor skills with your child writing um, or even zipping, buttoning, um, tying their shoes, you can absolutely work and strengthen fine motor functions. Same thing with eye tracking. There's some great games called Zingo and Scrabble that really can also work on eye tracking. 
we have this awesome handout that's going to give you a lot of different um, suggestions around visual exercises and fine motor exercises. It also gives you some information just on understanding processing in the brain and how the brain uh, works. And this is something that is put in the chat as well as it's something that will be emailed to you. So we highly recommend to be thinking about as you're going into the holiday season, how do you utilize um, the opportunity to purchase things that can actually strengthen brain connections. But here's the bottom line is if you're like, you know, Amanda, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of things. We are really struggling. We're struggling with homework. We're struggling with learning. Um, I would highly recommend to get a comprehensive assessment at Brain Balance. Um, just as I was sharing earlier, you know, the diagnosis is the what. It's a list of symptoms. What brain balance's assessment is, it, it, it explains the why. Why is your child struggling? Why do you see the symptoms you're seeing? And it gives you a better understanding of why. Because we're going to assess and look, does your child have any primitive reflexes that's impacting development? That's a barrier to development. We're also going to look at their sensory systems, their visual system, their auditory system. Can they smell? Can they feel their body? Because senses develop the brain and they're all important. Many times we just want to focus on certain ones because we think it's connected to learning, but it's not just your child's visual system and auditory system. It's their ability to physically feel. It's their ability to smell. A great example is with smell is think about your grandmother's home or when you go to your grandparents house and they cooked something right and and there was always that apple pie baking well now when you smell an apple pie you think about your grandparents smell is directly connected to memory so that's why we look not only at your child's visual system and their auditory system, but we also want to look at all of their senses because sensory development is key for specific areas of the brain. Then we want to look at their motor systems, gross motor, fine motor. We want to look at their coordination because just like I shared, a coordinated body is a coordinated brain. So if your child is struggling with body awareness, if they're struggling with coordination or muscle tone, this is an indication that there are under connections in the brain. Um, and so that's something we look at as well. And then we also can look at their eye tracking specifically to reading. And then also we can share with you perhaps why you're seeing the behavioral symptoms that you're seeing. So the goal of our comprehensive assessment is to explain to you why your child is strung, struggling. Where are their strengths in brain function? Because we can also share with you that, but then also where could there be weaknesses that's impacting that cross communication of the brain that's impacting their processing? Because at the end of the day, to have a teachable brain, you have to have optimal processing between the right and left hemisphere. So I highly recommend you to reach out to the local brain balance and have them do an assessment. And because you participate in one of our webinars, we often give a discount. We're offering $50 off of the assessment process. And this is so helpful for many parents because it allows you to see that there's more going on than what you originally thought. And it's not because of bad parenting. It's not because you're not doing enough. Usually there's a root cause for why your child is struggling. And so that's what we're here to tell you is we want to be able to explain to you why your child is struggling. What questions do we have coming in right now? Hi, Amanda. Um, we had a couple questions that were talking about specific ages Okay. Can you go through what ages um, most of our centers work with? Sure. We can serve children from ages four all the way into adulthood. So there are several centers that are offering an adult program. Um, all of our centers serve young adults that are college age. And then, of course, we can serve children as young as four years old. So we absolutely have a wide range of programs that are available. We have an at-home virtual program that the majority of the work is done at home. 
You also have in-center programs. We have what we call a hybrid program, which is a little bit of both in-center and at home. Um, so we customize the plan based on your family's needs. And it's also based on the assessment. We're going to customize a plan for your child. So that's what we're here to do. And we are here to help every family in every situation um, to customize things specifically for their needs. What's another question? Awesome, thank you, Amanda. We've also had a few questions about other diagnoses such as ADHD or autism and how those connect with the program and learning challenges. Absolutely. So if you look at, again, the DSM diagnosis for ADHD or even autism, it's really just a list of symptoms. And again, we're wanting to know why. Why does your child have the symptoms that they have? Where are their strengths in brain function and where are their weaknesses or under connections that's impacting the processing in their brain? So that's what we really focus on. And we absolutely do serve children with um, multiple diagnoses from ADHD, autism. Um, but again, we're not as hung up on the diagnosis. We serve children with a diagnosis and we serve children without a diagnosis because we're really looking at the root cause of why they're struggling. And then and putting a plan of action in place to strengthen brain connectivity, to strengthen the cross communication of the brain. So then you can have optimal processing in the brain and therefore you have a teachable brain. So that's what our goal is at Brain Balance. That's a great question. Thank you. We have another really great question. What if you haven't noticed any of these developmental processing delays that you've talked about, but you're still noticing that? your children are struggling with some areas of learning? Well, you really have to think about um, why are they struggling with learning, right? And so that's where feedback from the teacher is really helpful. Of course, you spending time with your child with homework time, um, preparing them for tests. Um, there's oftentimes different, you know, there's different perspectives from the teacher to the parent. Um, but many times parents don't realize that they, their child has active primitive reflexes because you may not see it to the naked eye until we actually assess them for it. Um, and the way that we assess is that we, it's an involuntary motor response, just as when you, you know, um, it's an involuntary motor response in the essence of, you know, the assessment process is we're looking for, uh, actually your child to not have the involuntary motor response any longer, but an active primitive reflex shows an involuntary motor response, but you wouldn't see them unless you assessed for them. You're maybe seeing the symptoms of a primitive reflex. Like for example, there's a primitive reflex called the spinal gallant reflex, right? And that's one where your baby's born with it. It actually facilitates in the birthing process and it helps move the baby through the birth canal. It's in your child's spine and it literally moves your baby through the birth canal. Um, however, after three to four months of them being birthed, they shouldn't need the spinal gallant any longer. However, symptoms of a spinal gallant is a child being fidgety all the time and constantly moving and can't stay seated for meals. That's actually a sign and a symptom of a spinal gallant reflex. And you may not visibly see the spinal gallant reflex, but you're experiencing the symptoms of it. Um, or they struggle with tags or certain clothing textures. That's also a sign and symptom of a spinal gallant reflex. So again, many times parents are experiencing the symptoms, but you may not actually be seeing the quote unquote primitive reflex in action until we assess for it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Another really good question is how does this connect with executive functioning skills? Oh, such a great question. <laughs> 
So executive functioning skills is a fancy word in the essence of it's really talking about frontal lobe development, right frontal lobe development and left frontal lobe development, and really the cross communication of the frontal lobe, which you need to have both hemispheres of the brain cross communicating effectively and efficiently to have optimal executive functioning. But it's also a fancy word for independent skills. All right. And here's the thing. I had this dad tell me a few weeks ago. He said, Amanda, we're not raising a child. We're raising an adult. We're preparing our child for adulthood. We're raising an adult. And I loved when he said that because it's true. Everything that you're doing as a parent is preparing your child for adulthood, right? And so that's what executive functioning skills are. It's all about the ability to be able to plan right? That's that motivation. That's your left frontal lobe. But then guess what? You need your right frontal lobe, the follow through. So not only do you need to plan, but you also need to follow through on the plan, right? You need to be able to think ahead. You need to be able to think when something doesn't go right, what else can you do? That's called problem solving, which is also part of executive functioning skills. So absolutely, any child that has underdevelopments in the brain or are having symptoms or struggles with learning, they are going to have struggles with executive functioning skills. And that's when parents are concerned oftentimes about their future in adulthood. Because again, when you have asymmetry in the brain and you have under connections in the brain, you are going to have difficulties with executive functioning. And that's independent skills and motivation. One of the things that I talk about in the center is that a sign and a symptom of your child having a weak executive function um, is there's no motivation for them to get their learner's permit or get their license. Okay, that's actually a developmental milestone that's appropriate for age 15 and 16. And if your child has no interest in driving, that's actually a sign and a symptom of underdevelopments in the brain, immaturity in the brain, and that's also a lack of independent skills. So when we're thinking about executive functioning, that's absolutely something that is critical for the future of their independence. That's a great question. We actually have a whole presentation on executive functioning. So if you go to our webinar link, look up executive functioning because there's a whole presentation specifically on that. Great question. I love that question. Thanks, Amanda. We have several questions about nutrition and diet and how they play a role and what the nutrition program addresses. Sure. So absolutely nutrition is important, right? Because what we put in our body can impact processing in the brain. It can impact, um, you know, overall brain function. Oftentimes certain foods can cause inflammation. And if you have inflammation in your body, it's going to impact the way your child's brain processes. So we actually have nutritionists that's um, part of our program and they actually walk you through looking at your child's eating habits and looking at what you're feeding them. And again, they create a customized plan. So they meet you as a family where you're at, and then they take you on a journey to be able to improve, you know, those eating habits and just be able to ensure that you're doing everything you possibly can as a parent to provide an environment that fosters optimal brain function and development. So of course, nutrition is a part of it. Um, and so that is something that we do have nutritionists that work with families um, and will walk with you through that journey. So that's a great question. All right. Well, you know what? It is nine o'clock on the Eastern side of things. And, um, and so we really do want to keep this to an hour again. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight to participate in our webinar. I really hope that this has given you some more answers. And again, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Please call the centers, text them. Um, and you can more than happy go in, take a tour, get an assessment and get a better understanding of why your child is struggling. Thank you so much. Have an awesome evening. Thank you, everyone.